Next up, we have Sebastian Kung from Kung or Kung, Kung. Okay, from the University of Zurich. Thank you very much. Uh, speaking about uh, software deployment and verifiable builds. Okay, so I'll be talking about software deployment, reproducible builds, and then I'll give some comments on why reproducible builds are still not enough, and why we need even better systems. Um, I'll also be talking about software deployment in a model where we do upstream releases, so releases as done in Monero, where the main developer tags um, the software at some point, then compiles this, and ships it to the public. And by doing so, he would, well, if everything would go perfectly, um, just launch a beautiful spaceship. But for the user side, he might just, oh shit, how do I go back? But from the user side, he might just have received a big old can of worms. So the question is, how do we go from source code to a program running on a user's machine? Um, so we have some source code. We compile it with the tool chain of our choice, be it GCC, LLVM, or some proprietary tool chain, and then publish it on either an app store um, a website like SourceForge or a self-hosted website. Now, if you deploy closed source software, this is all very, very easy. Basically, all you need to do is compile, publish it somewhere where you can be held somewhat accountable, and then bring some users to the group and make them use it and make some money with it. Um, this is obviously a very, very simplified system and something that probably every single person in this room strongly dislikes because the user has to completely trust the binary blob that he is receiving, not to sell, sell steal, or otherwise corrupt his data, to exactly do what it is specified to do by the publisher. And more importantly, he also cannot comfortably study, tweak, or share any aspects of that program. He also has to completely trust the publisher not to mess around with the binary. So for example, if you publish something on SourceForge, um, let's say five years ago or something, they would embed adware into their Windows installer and users would then get software that they did not intend to get. Um, also, we are a community-driven project, so you can't really hold um, the community accountable, even though we all obviously strive to perfect the quality of the software that we are shipping. Now, in free software deployment, where the user is able to study, tweak, share, and republish the software as it pleases, he obviously can also republish a tweaked version of the software that contains malware or adware. Um, the easiest solution for this is obviously what is done, or what has been done up until very recently in Monero, is ship the binary with the developer's signature, and then check that that developer is inside some web of trust, be it he's a public person, or he's inside the PGP strong set, or whatever you choose as your threat model. Um, getmonero.org also has some very easy instructions of how to verify this. And the file that contains all these hashes looks like this, so it's very easy to actually verify that a binary that you've received has the correct checksum. But this still kind of leaves the question open, how do we take care of updates? So in App Source, for example, updates are being taken for you more or less automatically. The developer, the developer can just publish a new version to the App Store, and um, your phone will then update the app automatically. 
Um, in Monero, on the other hand, we do have an update system, but we have to make sure that it also checks for some weird things like that old versions aren't replayed again, which will still have valid checksums and signatures, but might contain um, exploits that are dangerous to the user. So we need some way to take care of this toxic waste. Um, the way this is being done usually is through the update framework, or tough short. Um, and this spells out very precisely how to roll out updates securely, be it for closer software, compiled software, just a script, whatever. Um, basically, the user keeps a record of the binary's checksum, signatures, and versions in a separate file. That separate file is an update separately from the actual binary. Um, then checks are made for attacks that no time warping has occurred, and this gives you reasonable security. Um, Monero's update system was also evaluated against Tough in Monero issue 4958. Um, please take a look at this. Jason Wong, the producer of the Monero box, made some really great points on there. Um, next to more or less adhering to Tough, Monero also implements DNSSEC with additional fallbacks to protect against spoofing attacks when you have automatic updating available. Okay, so I'm going to make a little detour now and talk about static and dynamic linking of compiled software. So most software that is shipped in Debian, for example, um, is shipped as a dynamic binary, meaning it loads its required libraries from the system at runtime. You can, to a certain degree, freely swap out these um, shared libraries that your actual executable um, links to, as long as they follow a common ABI. So for example, if you publish um, a binary on Debian with apt, so for example, Monero D, and you then check what its um, dependent soft links are, you can do so with LDD, and it will give you a whole list of dependencies. This also gives you quite some transparency because you actually see what the developer used um, to compile your executable. But there's obviously a big downside to it, um, mainly that you need to manage all these shared libraries yourself. And if one of them goes missing, obviously your executable won't run properly. And this also counts for not only just missing, but also having version mismatches, etc. And if you deploy, for example, a, an application like Monero D to Windows, you have to include all the dynamic libraries with the binary directly. So these are non-system dependencies that are not being updated regularly on Windows. So you can't rely on Windows to patch your dependencies for you. So for example, if OpenSSL is having an exploit, Monero D will have to recompile everything and ship it with that new version of OpenSSL. So in general, this does require a lot of overhead to package since you, have, you ultimately want to target um, a very diverse set of operating systems and you have to cater for the quirks of each of these package managers. Um, there are some solutions to create packages um, inside a, I would call it a tiny file system, like an app image, but they come with their own trade-offs again. So if you, for example, generate an app image, you will get a single binary, but the single binary will um, have some shared libraries packed within it. So you again have the problem that as soon as one of the dependencies you are building with has an exploit, you have to update the entire thing again. So since we have this problem that we are shipping for um, Windows, um, static linking um, seems to be the same option. So in static linking, the libraries are bedded directly into the executable binary that you're shipping. And 
that takes, basically takes care of this problem then. But if you statically compile Win on Linux, you have to be a bit careful. So this is basically a hack. I wouldn't call this something that's generally appetized by um, developers working on Linux. But when you link a binary on Linux, it will also dynamically link in libc. And this will always be dynamic. Um, libc has a quirk that it is always forward compatible. So a new version of libc will run a binary that was compiled on a system with an old version of libc, but not vice versa. And the solution to this is redefine the symbols that are used in later systems um, inside your source code when you're compiling. And to check which system of G, or which version of glibc your binary is running with, you can just run opstamp-p. And once you've done that, you can run opstamp-t and then a binary name and grep for the libc version that you want to wrap then. And you do this by redefining the, the symbols in the source code with Simba. So every single, um, every single, um, sorry, I have a back out. <laughs> um, so for example, if you have a symbol defined in glibc version 2.17, um, this will have a single Simba entry inside the C library. But then when you are backtracking to all versions, you again have to be careful that those aren't susceptible to an exploit. So if you are back versioning, for example, glob from um, glibc version 2.27 to 2.17, you will run into this problem because it was patched in order to remove a CVE from um, that occurred or that, that would even allow you root access to a Linux system. And if you can't ship around this, you then really have to just embed this part of the C library directly into your source code. Um, I've written a blog post about how to do this exactly, and it's available when you go through that QR code. Okay, so I've argued now that we should generally use static linking um, when we are targeting a lot of platforms. Um, we know now how to roll out updates more or less securely. We know about checksums and developers' signatures. But we still have the problem that if the developer uses pre-compiled third-party libraries, these pre-compiled libraries can inject malware into the binary you're using. And the solution to this is to cross-compile all your dependencies from a single environment um, by installing the tool chains required for this on your host system. Um, this is now done in Monero with depends. Depends is basically a system of make files that was authored by Bitcoin Core developer Corey Fields. And these make files enable cross compilation for Linux, Mac OS, and Windows, and then targeting a bunch of different architectures, including ARM 32 bit, ARM 64 bit, and even RISC V. What Depends does is basically it gets the dependencies you're building with directly from source. It then verifies their checksum, compiles each of the dependencies for each architecture and operating system and installs them into a separate root directory that is generated within your depends environment. And so this root directory you can then later link to when you are compiling your actual application. Um, for this, I added the make depends target and then this architecture when the system triplet um, to make it fairly easy to use. Um, to add new packages to, the, to depends, um, it's fairly easy. Basically, all you need to do is create a new um, package file. For example, here, for example, I'm showing Lipsodium. Um, you have to give it a name, a version, um, where it should get it from source, a checksum, 
and then some commands to configure it correctly, to compile it correctly, and then to install it inside this depend system root. Um, a lot of these packages, when you cross-compile them, require additional patches. Um, these have a variety of reasons. For example, in Lipsodium, the developer decided that in the version string, he's just going to include a white space. And if you then pass that into GCC for some versions, it will obviously complain that there is a weird white space in between. Um, but there's also a lot of GNU packages that are completely outdated, where the last release was done when, for example, ARM 64-bit architectures weren't even defined yet properly. And you basically need to patch their entire source code in order to make them or in order to make that library compatible for ARM64. Okay, so the developer has now a safe set of libraries that he can compile from. He can update to users more or less securely. The users can verify that the update was received securely, but the users still have to completely trust the developer that he actually compiled the software correctly. So when a developer does a release, he can include malware at compile time, either willingly or subvertingly by someone having compromised his system. Um, typically, when you compile or build software on an application, two compilation runs of the same source code um, on two different systems will not produce the same binary. So you will get a functionally Functionally, you will get the same binary, like we'll have more or less the same functionality, but it will have different checksums. This is because when you compile software, the compiler will embed timestamps, system paths, dependency version, debug symbols, and a lot more junk into your actual binary. And the solution to ship around this is to run the compilation inside a container and have a common recipe for everybody to run this compilation run in exactly the same fashion every single time. And the process of doing this is called running reproducible builds. Um, Bitcoin and Monero use Gitian to run reproducible builds. Gitian is basically a collection of scripts that start a container and then run the builds as specified by the developer inside this container. Users can choose between KVM, LXC, and Docker um, as a backend for this virtual environment. And the build details are parsed from a .yml file that you can pass to the um, Gitchin scripts. This file includes all the compilation steps, the fake time setup that is required to set the system time to zero every time you are starting a new compilation run, and the toolchain installation. In Bitcoin and Mon Monero, this is, currently in a, this is currently bootstrapped from a container running an Ubuntu 18.04 image, and it obviously uses depends to compile all the dependency libraries. Um, the decision to use Ubuntu 18.04 was done with some consciousness. So Ubuntu is not the freest of um, distributions, but it does have some reproduce some repositories pre-configured that have very modern versions of GCC. And more importantly, it also uses apt, where the GCC compiler suite, to a certain extent, is repro reproducibly compiled. Um, once you have finished the compilation run in Gitian, the resulting binaries are copied back to the host system. And then Gitian produces this manifest file containing the checksums of the tools and the libraries used, um, and obviously the binaries and applications you are producing. And this file is then cross-compared to the manifest that other developers have built. And as soon as a certain threshold of people have produced the same um, manifest files, a release is then pushed out to the public. So for example, this is the, these are the top few lines of the Monero 0.14.1 um, release manifest file containing the checksums of um, the Linux binaries. Um, you can run this Gitchin setup yourself. It's 
fairly easy. Basically, what you need to do is install some virtualization environment, for example, Docker, then copy the Gitium build the Pi script from the Monero repository and run these two commands. Um, to inspect non-reproducibility sources inside software, um, I prefer using a tool called Diffoscope just because it's very, very easy to use and it's also a very small tool. It's basically a thin wrapper about, around object dump and read elf that just formats the output nicely. Um, there are plenty more tools to analyze non-reproducibility sources and you can find all of them on reproduciblebuilds.org. So right before we released 0.14.1, um, a source of non-reproducibility was found when I compared my binary to the one of Howard Chu. And basically the only difference was that on Howard Chu's machine, he had some more objects in his Git repository and the Git short hash would then include one character more than on my system where the Git repository had fewer objects. So it's very, very subtle changes that can already have a huge effect on the actual checksum in the end. We fixed this problem and now builds Monero are finally reproducible for every single platform we are releasing in. However, reproducible builds are still not enough. Um, they basically only guarantee that all binaries are equally compromised. So we still have to invest a lot of time into review of each of the dependencies we're using and obviously of the code that we are writing. The second problem we have is that we need to completely trust the tool chain, which most of the time just gets shipped as a binary blob. So even, for example, if you compile Arch Linux from, short, from source, you will start with some generic GCC compiler. Um, Carl Dong gave a really good talk about this two weeks ago at Breaking Bitcoin. And this general concept of distrusting your tool chain is called the trusting trust problem. And was first sort of termed by Ken Thompson in a keynote address when he received a prize for his work on um, Unix. Basically, the problem is that low-level compilers in the bootstrapping process of your tool chain can inject code into your high-level compilers. So what might be the case is that if we com have started some time ago in history, let's say somewhere in sometime in the 80s, um, and we have started this bootstrapping process with a compromised version of GCC, our entire tool chain might have been compromised all this time, and we wouldn't be all the wiser. So what we need to have again is full bootstrapability of our tool chain. And this is where Geeks comes in. So Geeks is a, still a fairly new Linux distribution that packs a functional package manager of the same name. And this functional package manager has the ability to bootstrap from a very, very small set of binaries. And the end goal is going to be that at some point in time, we'll have a few lines of assembly codes in a few different architectures. And from these few lines, we can then compile an entire Linux system. Um, I will probably start working on Geeks integration next. And once that is done, deploying and verifying will be even more simple than the system we have currently. Basically, just run Linux and execute one or two commands. OK. Um, before I finish, I quickly want to thank Idunk, Howard Chu, Faro, Smu, and Ray for supporting me in um, for the work I did over the past year, and especially to Ray for organizing the conference. Well, let's uh, thank Sebastian after he thanked me. Um, thank you guys again for uh, coming to the Monero Conference. So first day, first couple of sessions. Um, we're going to be reconvening at I believe 145. We have about an hour and a half for lunch. There's a bunch of good places nearby. Um, we'll see you guys about an hour and a half. But before I really call it, 
I apologize. Does anybody have any questions for Sebastian? Yes, we have two questions at least. Um, thanks for the talk, um, especially talking about reproducible builds. You know, now that that functionality is is kind of rolling out and it's you know kind of the finalized versions of being able to do reproducible builds are pretty new. Um, how do you think that that is going to affect kind of the user facing side of Monero deployments in the future? You know, we've been doing you know signed builds so far. Now we have the capability to do reproducible builds, and people can throw around their checksums on IRC and stuff. But I guess kind of from a user facing infrastructure point of view, what do you see changing going forward to present this to users who want to verify builds? So user facing, I don't see too much of a change. Basically, you will still um, ship an agreed checksum and maybe the maintainer signatures. So in this case, Ricardo's signature. And then have some good documentation, though, on how to reproduce the binary that is being shipped. How about kind of the threshold stuff that you talked about where, you know, we get enough, you know, you get enough developers who maybe people's, the, the names of whom people recognize, you know, to, to do kind of their own signed checksums. Does that end up being on its own repository somewhere? Like, what, is, what does that end up looking like? If I don't necessarily want to reproduce the build myself, but, you know, I know a few names who have done it themselves. So these manifest files that I showed earlier, they should, in theory, or they are being published now um, on the Gitian.6 repository in the um, Monero project group. And you can basically check um, all the different manifest files that people upload on there. Yeah. Cool, thanks. And um, the question is when they are done, like right now, they're done. <laughs> All right, well, everybody, thanks, Sebastian, again.